welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. I'm here at Quito Salt Lake for a conference which just started today and I caught up again with Dave Feldman who just gave a fascinating talk again on LDL but with some very new data so great to see you again Dave. Yeah likewise Ivor thanks for having me. Not at all always a pleasure. Now you had new data today because I know that we've always wondered about LDL being a problematic compound in the body and it seems there's been a lot of data over the last five or six years where when LDL is high but other things like HDL are high and triglycerides are low most of the data suggests there's no problem with LDL being high but today was different because you pulled databases of 50,000 people and you did a bit of analysis and the results were quite stunning so maybe if you start going through some of those yeah, well, of course, as you know, this, is, this has been a bit of a long history. Uh, I've not been in the space quite as long as you have, but in the time that I have, I've been interested in how these markers play out, uh, particularly, as you were kind of mentioning, outside of LDL, uh, HDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. And it's always been a bit frustrating because, as you know, all we pretty much can do is trade studies between each other. If we ourselves are not you know, researchers with that data on hand, it's hard for us to look through raw data. But we're engineers, right? So engineers, we like to get under the hood of things and start taking it apart. So I was fortunate to have the help of Tommy Wood um, in being able to get a hold of the NHANES data. And uh, I, I can't say right offhand, but it's basically the North American, um, it's, it's a kind of survey data, but also includes a lot of blood work, which was pretty fascinating. And they're in different kinds of sets, but the set we got a hold of was basically everything from 1999 to, I want to say, 2015. So it's really quite a lot of data. I think, it, I think once we uh, determined everybody who is eligible, it came in at around, I want to say, 40,000. And once I had that in hand, I just went crazy. I had a good time because, of course, I wanted to know for myself without anybody curating the data for me in their study and by using adjustments they wanted to use, what would I see, right? So naturally, without wasting any time at all, I went, all right, I want to see LDL, and of course my favorite market, which you know, is all-cause mortality, live longer or not, right? So immediately I went into LDL and stratified it against all-cause mortality. And guess what? Higher LDL, higher all-cause mortality. So, wow. Well, Actually, this actually makes it fairly, and it was stepwise. It looked really like a strong case for those who believe in the lipid hypothesis that, no, in fact, this is a risk factor. High LDL equals high all-cause mortality. Well, then I went to check to confirm that, indeed, all of these people in the stratifications were nearly identical to each other in many of the things that also matter for mortality, such as age. They're not. <laughs> so... I then had to go, all right, where is it that I could find where the ages will have parity to each other? And I found that that could be in age 50 and up. So once we had age 50 and up, and then we stratified by LDL again, and then on top of that you apply uh, follow-up time, because the follow-up time was also different between these different stratifications. So we just changed it to be simply the mortality per year of follow-up. Simply put, if you have an LDL of say zero to 80, what percent of those people in your group are going to die per year, right? So standardized by age, which you must do because age is a huge risk factor for mortality. It, it yeah. sure is. <laughs> so standardizing by age and standardizing by the follow-up period. So to get the per year. Correct. And that's perfect data now to look at LDL linkage to all-cause mortality. So That's right. What did you see with this treatment? The graph flipped. All of a sudden we see the mortality per year of follow-up is highest at the lowest levels of LDL. And as you can see, as you move upwards in LDL, it actually gets lower, which does complement existing studies that we have seen of those that show higher LDL has lower all-cause mortality. 
But now I actually got to see it for myself with the data directly. I got to actually be playing with the data, do very minimal adjustments. And all those adjustments are uh, in the slideshow. All I did was I basically removed um, anybody who didn't have any of the major lipid numbers. Removed anybody that had triglycerides over 400 since we were using the Friedwald equation. You removed people who were treated with lipid lowering? That's right. And that was the one of their adjustments. We removed everybody who had statins. Yeah, which of course you'd have to do because that's going to change every natural relationship between biomarkers and, and death by having a drug. So your data is perfectly clean. Now another interesting thing is NHANES data has been criticized because a lot of it has food questionnaires, food frequency questionnaires. So the Harvard School of Public Health go to NHANES and they try and make correlations with diet and disease. But that's different because there right. you can have confounders. But just to stress for anyone listening, this is LDL values and all cause and cardiovascular mortality. There is no confounding. This is just the reality of the data. More specifically, mm. I didn't even bother with any of the dietary data yet. I'm not even sure how interested I would be in it. I was interested in going straight to the blood work. Yeah. Right? So if what would it matter if you were getting um, any kind of data from diet if at the end of the day that's not even what you were wanting to look at? And that was the case for me. Absolutely. Diet is only for the people trying to make correlations between diet and disease, but that's exactly not what you're interested in here. It's the LDL versus mortality. Right. So you, when you corrected for age, which is crucial, and corrected for follow-up period, which is uh, crucial also, you got a graded higher LDL, lower mortality all-cause, but also lower cardiovascular mortality, I think. Well, here's where it gets funny. Mm. I didn't spend that much time on it. <laughs> So, as was a big portion of my talk, while I do find the question of cardiovascular disease important, no question, right? It's not as important as the mother of all of them, which is all-cause mortality. Do you live longer or do you live shorter by how much LDL you have, right? Because the problem is, is if we're looking only at one marker, as I bring up with my, with my kind of humorous example, but it's to punctuate a point, the cyanide diet, right? If I put you on a cyanide diet, guess what? I guarantee I'll reduce your chance of dying of a heart attack by 100%. And I'll reduce your chance of dying of Alzheimer's disease by 100%, right? That was much of my talk. The much of my talk was to introduce those things that LDL can also be potentially beneficial toward. And the only way you can really know is if you look at the balance at the end of the day, right? Is if, is if it turns out that people who have low LDL have a higher association with cancer, how can you know if having low LDL is in fact in some way causal towards cancer? Well, you can't really easily know that. You can't as easily know that with LDL and heart disease if in fact it turns out that that's part of the body's strategy for containment, right? So that's why I want to see, look, looking at all of the numbers together, particularly for mortality, do you just live longer if you have higher LDL? And the NHANES data, with very minimal adjustments. And let me, just, let me just add one more thing. This is the beginning of a conversation, not the end of one. Mm -hmm. So other people who have access to the NHANES data, and if they, if they think they have a better, more accurate way to show of it, I absolutely welcome that. But this was the most minimal way that I could see that you could adjust it and look cleanly at all-cause mortality. But I'm definitely interested in any other ways to do this. For now, though, it looks like, particularly after age 50, the one time we could get parity with age, the higher your LDL, generally speaking, the lower your all-cause mortality. Yep, there you have it. And again, we kind of knew elements of this from other data sets, data sets and studies, but the beauty of this is it's straight from the raw database right. with minimal manipulation so we can really trust it. Fantastic. Now, another thing that's sometimes said is, well, the lower LDL people could have higher mortality, but this reverse causation, in other words, people who are sick and have other problems, their LDL could go down, and then you get an association with low LDL and all-cause mortality. But to those people, I always sent the BMJ paper from around six, seven years ago, and a guy looked at the Framingham data, or a team, and they went back 20 years of LDL measurements and they showed with no question that the low LDL linked to mortality was present for the full 20 years prior to the death. So in other words, there was no got a disease, LDL went down, correlation. The LDL was low for 20 years of tracking. 
without any exception. So the reverse causality does not apply specifically for cancer, which was the question, but I would say also for everything else. Well, and this, this is something that I also like the NHANES data for. The age that's listed in the NHANES data is the time at which you took the test, right? Mm. Then you have follow-up, and follow-up could be five, ten years longer, right? Yes. So you see where I'm going here? I see where you're going. You essentially have a version of the study I just described because you're generally seeing the LDL 10 or 15 years before the death. Right. And obviously, if, and to be sure, I haven't done a deeper analysis on it. I want to before I answer this fully. But I think I would have spotted certainly a, a large degree, if you will, of low LDL combined with a long follow-up time. Um, that, that would be very meaningful. If you have a long follow-up time after having a low LDL, that speaks to that data directly, right? Just a quick break to remind you that this podcast is only possible due to funding from David Bobbitt and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity. For middle-aged people, it is imperative to find out your heart attack risk by getting a CT scan of the heart and your CAC score. The new IHDA.ie website has all the scan resources, Please support us by visiting and sharing widely. Knowing your score, you can take action to stop the disease process and save your own life. It can even be as simple as removing sugar, refined carbs and seed oils, i.e. processed food, from your diet. And now we return to the conversation. Yeah, and also that 20-year study I mentioned, they also saw dramatic consistency within person for LDL readings when they had multiple readings. Right. So it wasn't even the case that you got one low reading. They showed consistency and remarkably tight error bars per person. Their LDL was broadly consistent throughout the long period. So I think this is really tight data and in a sense this data overturns all of the theory that higher LDL is worse, even higher LDL over life is worse and this resonates with all the autopsy data that shows no link between LDL and atherosclerosis level and links with many other studies for show L which show LDL doesn't really show up and yet we still have this pervasive belief that LDL is the sine qua non or the key thing in CVD and in disease so it's going to take a long time to overturn that do you think well in I'll give a little more of a nuanced answer. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I definitely do think that your LDL can be high for a bad reason. Uh, and I kind of go into that into the talk and I don't want to unpack that too much, but I'm just going to say basically this, that I think it can be a downstream result of something. To the degree with which it's a cause of something, that I have a little more of a challenge toward, right? But as a downstream result of something, as I mentioned in the talk, the two main channels of area are metabolic dysregulation. If you're metabolically unhealthy and therefore you have more VLDLs, right? Yeah. And also if you're in a state of a challenge such as a disease, and if, especially if it's chronic disease like chronic inflammation, you also may have more VLDLs because there may be more, for example, cytokines signaling to the liver to generate more of these to help fight it, right? Yes. But in both of these examples I just mentioned, you see higher remnants right, which are those lipoproteins that actually aren't LDLs, but also have cholesterol, and they tend to be bloated with triglycerides, right? Mm -hmm. In metabolic dysregulation, you have trouble parking the triglycerides into the mm -hmm. tissues, which is another reason why you see high triglycerides, which is why in both cases, you pretty much can often look to triglycerides, and especially low HDL. Either of those two, and especially both of them, already have in the literature something known as atherogenic dyslipidemia, which is the two of those together coupled with, uh, or finally added to with um, a small dense, a preponderance of small dense LDL particles, right? If you have the flip side of that and high LDL, I have yet to see in the data where this is associated with worse outcomes, especially with all cause mortality. And that is a problem with the very thing you're talking about. The context definitely matters. And it sounds like, I mean, I've kind of found this for six or seven years now, LDL kind of ride shares on the back of more, much more important root causes because it tends to track, like higher particle count is a classic indication of metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance. So it's going to tr track and ride share. And the LDL itself, 
I mean, really, Professor Ken Sakaris from, I don't know, is it Australia or New Zealand? It's Australia. Australia. Fantastic lecture recently, and he showed me something I'd known from papers five years ago. But when your HbA1c is in the normal range, the LDL is moderate levels on huge data sets. When your HDL or your HbA1c goes into pre-diabetic, the LDL rises, right? So now LDL is correlating with high HbA1c. Right. And later, when you have even higher uh, HbA1c, the LDL comes down again. And when you get really high HbA1c, the LDL goes right up. So it's such yet another example where LDL is tracking with other much more important causes and getting gifted with a correlation with heart disease. And you want to know my theory for that, by the way? Mm. My theory for that is because what's actually happening is you have a higher triglyceride response, especially in like a very intensive uh, refined carbohydrate diet, right? Mm. It's kind of comparable to the glucose response where basically you have a hyperinsulinemic response that shuttles away both the glucose and the higher triglycerides, but per the energy model, what gets left over? Higher LDL. You have higher LDL because there was more trafficking of the VLDLs leaving LDL left over. So in a sense, LDL almost acts like a quasi-remnant there. It's an after effect of much more important processes that are linked to disease. Right, that's my oh. theory on that. Again. I like to say this a lot, but looking at LDL is sort of like looking at the last chapter of a long book. You don't know the story before the last chapter, so you can't say a lot about what it means. And to that analogy, it is certainly not a summary chapter either. No, <laughs> it's, no it's a very not. <laughs> specialized, disjointed, separate chapter just stuck at the end of the book. Right, right. And that's why like, I, I've always been excited to have the opportunity to look at LDL in the context of these other markers. That's why Ian Haynes was a game changer for me personally. But I think I want to make it also a game changer for us in this conversation. You and I, we obviously agree on quite a lot, but there's a lot of people who are watching us right now who don't agree, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're, especially if you yourself are already a scientist and you can get access to the Ian Haynes data, because it is publicly available, and as I understand, a lot of university students uh, work from it as well then you can carry this conversation forward with us because unlike trading studies, we can actually trade analysis on the same data set. I would be interested in what anybody could come up with with the NHANES data to just, in a justifiable way, something that makes sense to show that no, LDL is worse at higher levels for all cause mortality. Yeah. Or even perhaps with some more analysis, and I know you have some tentative stuff, we won't get into it yet, even cardiovascular mortality when HDL is appropriately high and triglyceride is low, we may yet see that even for cardiovascular mortality, that higher LDL does not indicate any extra mortality. Possibly, yeah. Possibly. Excellent. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do for this one, Dave. I always intend it, but I don't get to it. I'm too busy. I will take some of your graphs from the presentation as we discuss this in this podcast and put them in there just for people to see them because they're quite dramatic. And yeah. uh, it's just fascinating <laughs> to look at them. Uh, and they're so iconoclastic or disruptive to most of the world's belief system. Uh, so we'll do that. And uh, we'll hopefully people will look at the NHANES database. As you say, it's freely available. Do some analysis, come up with counterpoints. But I suspect that they won't be able to come up with any. That's just my thought. We'll see. We'll see. Thanks a lot, Dave. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left. Otherwise, please do subscribe to the audio podcast. Thanks.